Yesterday we began uh, with Genesis 3.15. Those who are joining us today, we began on Genesis 3.15. Where the Bible says, I will put an enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So we discovered that, number one, medically speaking, a woman does not have a seed. So this is a prophetic language to bring us to understanding that God, it is the first prophecy about the Messiah. Because we are told the seed, it shall be a he. And the Bible says, he shall, uh, he shall bruise, you shall bruise his heel, but he shall bruise your head. And we'll discover that the best way to kill a serpent is to hit the head. So the heel of the he will be bruised, but the head of the serpent will be dealt with. Are we together? But we also discovered that immediately that prophecy was released, there was battle of the seed. That's what we call the message. The battle of the seed. Are we together? And we are going to look at it. And, I, and, and you will discover that in the whole of Old Testament, the devil was targeting anything born under this prophetic climate. Whatever was born that looked like it can be the seed, the devil made sure that that person was affected. And yesterday we saw uh, two children were given to Adam. One was Cain and Abel. And who discovered that Abel began to manifest the character of God. And Cain manifested the character of the devil. And we see in the coexistence of the two seeds, Cain is, I mean Abel is killed and it looked like that was the seed. That was going to be transferred. And after Cain dies. We discover that God didn't run out of option. He raises another seed. By the name of Seth. And in the days of Seth. The Bible says men began to call upon the name of the Lord. In the days of Cain and Abel. Men were offering to God. But in the days of Seth. They began to call upon the name of the Lord. And we saw the corruption that came in the world. The daughters of men began to sleep. With the sons of God. And, and they gave birth to men of renown. And we say that Noah was righteous because he was a pure breed. He never interacted with the daughters of men. And so were his children. So God was willing to begin afresh. And we discover that in every generation, there will be temptation to mix the seed. But God will always preserve his seed. Are we together? And so now... We have what they call the pre-flood generation. That is the generation that existed before the flood. And we know the flood was both judgment and cleansing. God for the first time regretted to having created man. And so he uses water to cleanse the world. But he spares a man that is ready to begin with um, afresh. And that man is Noah. And I want us to look at a prophetic word that was released by Lamech in the book of Genesis 5, uh, 28. Because when you begin to read about Noah after the flood, you will discover that this very prophecy was fulfilled. Let's look at Genesis 5, 28. Lamech lived 182 years and had a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work. And the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cast. Are you seeing it? So, let, let me just tie it with the scripture so that you can, you, can, you can begin to understand what I'm talking about. Let's look at Genesis 9 from 20. Genesis 9 from 20. Welcome dad. Genesis 9 from 20. And Noah began to be a farmer and he planted a vineyard. Remember the prophecy had everything to do with this particular seed is going to deal with the curse that was on the ground. In the whole of Genesis, we don't hear anyone doing farming. This is the first case of farming. Now, the curse was released on the ground, not on the man. And the ground was made to release thorns. But after God had judged the world and cleansed the world with the water, when Noah planted a vineyard, there was a harvest. Are you getting it? There was a prophetic decree from his father. 
and he survived the floods because the Bible says Noah began to be a farmer and he planted a vineyard. Okay, let's look. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. Now, that's where the problem began. Now, the man planted a vineyard uh, and, and I was reading somewhere and someone said, beware of what you plant after great victory. It was after the floods that he planted the vineyard and this is the first case of a drunkard man in the Bible. And the consequences are intensive. But when you begin to see it from the seed battle, you will understand. Are we together? Because now we see that Noah is preserved. And God is willing to begin another generation with Noah. But immediately after the floods, the devil has not stopped the war on the seed. So immediately after the flood, Noah drinks. Let's read the story so that we can understand what happens. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, cast be Canaan. Now, elimination method has begun. There is a seed that has to be preserved. And that seed must pass through generation until when the seed of the woman will appear to deal with the head of the serpent. Now, Noah gets drunk and curses his own child. Meaning that that child, that seed is eliminated in the agenda of heaven. Because God cannot partner with anything that is cursed. And Noah is an authority. So this man is taken out of the equation. And we are left with two sounds. Let's look at it. And he said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Now, Shem was the one that was blessed. So, now we are coming from Noah, and we are going to Shem. Are we together? And I tell you, when you read, when you read uh, Genesis 9, uh, uh, and you'll discover that it was out of harm that Nimrod came. The cursed child. A rebellious people arose out of that particular seed. But I bless the Lord. Irrespective of that, there was still shame. Are we together? Irrespective of that, there was still a seed preserved. So that the agenda of heaven can be fulfilled. And if I fast forward, it is out of shame that we get terror. The father of Abraham. Are we together? So now we can begin to see how the seed is being preserved. And I tell you, when you go to the genealogy in Matthew, you will see it fall in place. So out of shame, now we have terror. But there's a problem with terror. First of all, the name terror means delay. Begins to give you a prophetic picture. Terror was the father. And let's look at Genesis 11. From 31. Genesis 11 from 31. And Terah took his son Abraham and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abraham's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. So their journey was to end up in Canaan. But the man carries the name Delay. He does not go where he had intended to go. And this journey was a prophetic journey. They were not just traveling. There was a reason why they were traveling. Because there was an assignment of the seed of terror in Canaan. Are we together? Because later, after terror died, God has to call Abraham and tell him to complete the journey. And it begins to bring a picture of there is a generation that has to rise and complete what the other generation never completed. So it is illegal to die where our fathers died. Are you getting it? 
There has to be an urgency. The father had an assignment to go to Canaan, but the man died in Haran. That was not the destiny. The destiny was meant to be in Canaan. But the man dwelt in Haran. I don't know why. We, we are not given any reason. But it brings to bring a prophetic picture that there has to be a people to pick up the journey and complete and enter where the fathers never entered. Hallelujah. I am happy because the father began the journey, but I'm also excited because Abraham finished the journey. And I want to speak prophetically where your father died, that shall not be a place of death. You must go farther than your father's. Hallelujah. Whatever they achieved, you must achieve more. Because the grace upon your life is different. And so God has to wait for delay to die. So that now Abraham can continue with the journey. Are we together? The name terror means delay. Now remember this time they were not serving God. They were just serving strange gods. But because of the bloodline and the lineage where Abraham came from, there was a divine assignment for that particular seed. Hallelujah. And so it is in Genesis 12. It is in Genesis 12 from verse 1 where now we see God dealing with Abraham. This time it's called Abraham. Now the Lord has said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Are we together? Get out of your country. Out of your family. And out of your father's house. This is the journey of separation. When you read the Bible you will discover that Abraham was separated seven times. Seven is the number of divine completion. He was separated until he was completed to fulfill the assignment of heaven. The first separation was country because his assignment was not in Haran. His assignment was in Canaan. But there I came to discover every assignment and every anointing has a location. Sometimes you struggle not because you are not anointed, not because you don't know your purpose, but you are still in Haran. The grace is not in Haran. The grace is in Canaan. And so the first separation was from the country, the location where he was. Because assignment begins to attract location. Are we together? That's why anytime God wants to do something with a man, there has to be a reprogramming of schedule. The location of David had to change from looking after the sheep to going where God wanted him to go. The location of Moses had to change from palace to wilderness to back to palace to deal with the people. So anytime you begin to operate with the will of God, be ready for a change of schedule and programs. Hallelujah. Now, the first separation was from the country. The second one was from the family. The relatives, and there, there's a big picture here, even when we begin to look at our own lives. Every child of destiny must be separated from their country. The ideologies of Kenya, the tribal nature, the corruption nature, we must be separated from that thinking and begin to think as a child of heaven. Are we getting it? Because every country has its own culture and way of operation. So God is saying, I'm separating you from this country because there is an assignment. That's why the Bible says, though we are in the world, we are not of the world. We, we are from another kingdom. So we, we need to understand we are Christians first before we become Kenyans. We are Christians first before we become our tribe. Are we together? Then there was the issue of family, the issue of relatives. And personally, I believe this has to do with cultural settings. The traditions of our people. Whatever people call the my people ideology. We have to be separated. And then there was the separation from father's house. This one tells me it is a separation from anything that limited his father. Family curses, family diseases, family patterns separated from them. Are we getting the picture? Because these things were written for us. 
The separation does not end here. There was drought and they ran to Egypt. And they were separated from Egypt. That is separation number four. They were separated from Egypt. What is the picture of Egypt? Is the place we run to when the wilderness is too intensive. When God called me, I decided to go and do my master's. And in my second semester, there was no school fees, but there was money for ministry. That was my Egypt. <laughs> and he asked me, who shall employ you and have employed you? So there are places we run to, though we know the voice of God. Are you getting it? And when he was in Egypt, he survived with lies. <laughs> Whether you call them partial lies, a lie is a lie. There is no degree of lie. Because he said, this is not my wife, this is my sister. It is true. Sarah was the sister, but they never went there as brother and sister. They went as a couple. So, Sarah was the wife. <laughs> Are you getting it? Out of Egypt, number five, he was separated from Lot. These are spiritual friends that are not ready to pay spiritual prices. A lot is not a backslider. He's a man that comes to church. But these are the people who tell you we are together in the spirit. You go in the cash and pray for me. That's a lot. And there are people who know what you carry. And they know when they hang out around you. The grace upon your life is going to benefit them. You have enough networks. You have enough grace. And so they have to hang around. So separation number five is Lot. Lot was not a spiritual man. He was a carnal Christian. We know that by the time they were told to, se to select. He chose the mountain places. The place of plenty. But Abraham chose the place of promise. When you enter the place of promise with the grace of God, though it looks like a desert, it must become successful. Where a lot entered, he perished. Where Abraham entered, he succeeded because of the grace upon his life. Are you getting me? Separation number six from Ishmael. Who is Ishmael? Whatever is not in the will of God, there are many man-made miracles, many man-made doors, many man-made opportunities. We try to drag God in it, but we know he's not there. Ishmael must go. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, we live in a generation of sponsors. You go get a job because of a sponsor and you come with a fast fruit. And you say, God has opened a door. My friend, the day you get fired, we cannot pray you out. Why? That was Ishmael from the first day. God said you shall get a child through Sarah, not her guy. Are you getting it? And there was contention there. We are going to address it. So be ready for anything that is not born of God. Allow me to share just a short story. I used to work in an NGO. And one day I was posted somewhere to manage two counties. And they used to give me a lot of money. And there was good opportunity to steal. And I tell you, I pocketed good money. And I came home. And one day, all the things I bought with the money, my house was swept clean. And I was coming from a prayer kesha. I entered the house. The Holy Ghost reminded me, there is nothing that belonged to you here. These were stolen goods. Ishmael must go. I didn't complain. I gave thanks. And I said, Lord, I'm ready to begin with you. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, it is not easy to let Ishmael go. But he must go. If the will of God must be performed in your life. The final separation of Abraham was separation from Isaac. That was the final and the toughest. And that was the confirmation that Abraham loved God. That was it. You see, God tells him, take your son, your only son, meaning that God never recognized Ishmael. <laughs> Said your only son. Tells him, and Abraham obeys the following day, goes to the mountain, and God says, since you have done what I've told you to do, in his heart, Isaac was dead. Now, what is Isaac? A picture of blessing. There is a time the blesser will want to know 
Between the blessing and the blesser, where do I stand? Those are the levels men are commanded to surrender things sacrificially. Know that God is interested with them. God is interested with you, not what you have. Are you getting it? And many believers fail on that test. The test because most of us are in the house of God for the things of God. And I'll give you a very simple story because this is how it works, especially when it comes to giving. You know, one day I go with my niece to the shop and she tells me, ah, I want biscuits and I buy biscuits and I give to her. She opens the box and begins to eat and I tell her, just give me a piece and she hides behind. Says, mm -mm. And God just told me, this is how believers behave. I had change in my pocket. I had enough money to buy other boxes. And I was just saying, just give me a piece. This young girl has forgotten. I'm the one who has bought the biscuits. How many of us sometimes we hear the voice of God, but we? Mm -mm. And we forgot all that we are, all that we have. It is him. It is his. We are just custodians. That was the attitude of Abraham. And God said, now because you love me in blessing thee, now I trust you and I can entrust you. Now I'm ready to release what I have to you. Are you getting it? That was the final separation of Abraham. And we see there was battle because whatever Abraham was anointed to conceive was not a child but nations. He was told you shall be a father of many nations. Whatever Abraham birthed became a nation, even Ishmael. And that was the first hijacking because now the devil was just locating who has the next mantle to release the seed? Abraham. Let me fight him in his desperate moment. Now that Sarah cannot conceive, let me create plan B so that I can hijack the agenda of heaven. And the funniest thing, they never gave birth to a girl. They gave birth to a son. And God had promised a son. But still, God made it sure that the one I will release will come in the time of impossibility so that you may know this is a sure Seed from God. Are you getting me? Though the first seed was hijacked. The second seed. That Abraham delivered. It was not out of his biological ability. It was out of supernatural intervention. It was a godly seed. In the womb of a dead womb. Are you getting me? And now. The battle of the seed continues. So Abraham. Is fought. Ishmael is born. And I tell you even today, the battle is still there. The seed of Ishmael and Isaac. So we shift from Abraham, we come to Isaac. Isaac marries Rebekah. Twins are born. Twins. And God does not speak to Isaac. Let me, let me nullify this thing. There was no problem with what Rebekah did to make sure that Jacob receives the blessing. Isaac did not know what Rebekah knew. God spoke to Rebekah and said, there are two nations in your womb. Remember when Abraham blessed his son Isaac, he released the ability to give birth to nations. Okay. Now Isaac, God comes and tells Rebekah, there are two nations in your womb. But the younger shall rule over the older. That's a prophecy. And God creates an opportunity for the older to sell his birthright. So if Esau was blessed, it was against order. Because he that has the birthright has legal ground to receive blessing. So according to heaven, Jacob never stole. Before the father laid hands on him, he had received spiritual capacity to be blessed. Because he had the birthright of the firstborn. And the blessing could not come to another person. It had to come to the firstborn. Are we together? And the Lord saw in the future the seed of Jacob and the seed of Esau. The Bible says the young will rule the older. But there was contention. I want you to listen to me carefully. 
there was contention. You go through Bible, you will discover Herod was an Edomite. And Edom came from Esau. Jesus came from Jacob. When Jesus was born, there was the historical battle of Esau and Jacob because Herod wanted to meet Jesus, not to negotiate, but to see who is this who is coming to rule over the older. It was prophecy playing out. Are you getting it? Because God knows the end from the beginning. And this battle continued. And the truth is, the younger ruled, not just in this story, but he ruled even in the future over the older. Are we together? Are we together? Are you locating the seed now? Are you seeing the battles of the seed? Now Esau begins to pursue Jacob. Okay? And Jacob is running away from Esau. And I discovered sometimes we are running away according to ourselves. We are running away but according to God we are running too. The reality is you are running from Esau but you are running to Laban because in you is the blessing of nations. And in the atmosphere of Esau, you cannot deliver nations. So the Lord has to organize chaos for you to find yourself in Laban's house. Because there we have Leah and Rachel waiting for you. Because now Israel must be born and your identity must change when the nation is born. And that's why I began to say, some runnings are prophetic and they are divine. According to you, you are running from Esau. According to God, you are running to Laban. Because in Laban's house, you will not live as Jacob, you will live as Israel. You must live according to the prophetic mandate. Are you getting it? And so Jacob runs there and he falls in love with Rachel. But he ends up liking Leah. He's shortchanged during the wedding. And that's where the Genesis came of unveiling the bride. So that you confirm it is not Leah. It is Rachel. And I tell you, love can make you do good things. Amen. The man waited for 14 years to have Rachel. Are we together? And, and out of the seed there, he gets the 12 children. But as he's blessing the children, he gives a prophetic hint of who shall carry the seed. And he says, O ye Judah, the scepter shall never depart from thee. Others are blessed, but Judah is given the scepter. The scepter was a sign of kingship. So already now we are seeing the seed now forming shape. It is clearer to God and to the devil that now Judah is the one that carries the seed. So the battle is not in Joseph. The battle is in Judah. And Judah has three sons. And Judah messes up with daughter-in-law. Sleeps with her. This is a very serious level because by the time he slept with the daughter-in-law, according to the law, that seed could not enter the assembly of the Lord. I believe it has to be in Numbers 23 too. Let's look. Not Numbers, Exodus. Exodus. No, is it Exodus or Deuteronomy? Let me confirm. Because something serious happened. Yes, Deuteronomy 23 2. Let me show you what happened. It's a serious thing. One of illegitimate birth shall not enter the assembly of the Lord even to the 10th generation, none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord. Now what does this mean? Anyone born 
in, in an illegitimate way could not enter the assembly of the Lord. Neither do anything. Now Judah sleeps with Tamar. The child that is born or the children that are born, none of them can carry the seed. There is now serious disorder and we must wait for 10 generations. The template is messed up. Hello. I'm trying to show you a historical battle. Are you getting it? And Pastor Mark, I began to understand. When David slept with Bathsheba, they got a child. God killed the child. David was fasting for the child. And I, I never understood until I came here. That seed was illegitimate. Again, we would have waited for 10 generations before something comes that could take place from David. It was this pattern of Judah that began to represent itself in. Okay, we shall look at that tomorrow. Because it's heavy when you begin to understand. For 10 generations, the devil had struck the one that carries the seed. Ten generation is not a short time. A generation is between 40 to 50 years. We are talking about for 500 years, the agenda of the seed has been suspended. And, and this is where now the Bible takes another dimension. If you ask me, the book of Judges was a book to buy time. So that ten generation can pass. That is why when Saul is anointed king, what does he begin by saying? But I'm a Benjamite. It was not self-esteem. It was prophetic accuracy. I don't come from the tribe of Judah. I come from Benjamin. The prophecy says the scepter shall not depart from Judah. And Samuel anoints him with a flask anointing to tell him, dude, you are temporal before David rises because David is the tenth in that lineage after Judah. He's there, he's the tenth. Can we prove it? Let's go to the genealogy in Matthew. You'll begin to see it. Now genealogies are making sense. Amen. And I like genealogies because it's a language of fathers. There is no mother there. So and so begat and fathered. So and so begat. So it is fathers who begat and father. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. But then one of the assignments I'll give you, go and read the genealogy of Luke. Because Luke begins from Abraham. And he does not mention Cain and Abel. He mentions Seth. And he begins from down going up. But Matthew, Matthew is a Jewish writer and he wants to confirm something. And before the end of the week, I'll show you a very historical Jewish argument and that's where they stand to say Jesus is not the Messiah. And if you can answer that question, we can begin to evangelize to the Jews. The question of Jaconiah. Uh -huh. Abraham begot, uh, go continue. I, yes, Judah begot Perez. Are we together? I tell you, when we begin from Judah to David, you'll find that there are 10 generations. So Judah begot Perez 1, uh, Perez begot Hezron 2, Hezron begot Ram 3, uh -huh. Ram begot Aminadam 4, Aminadam begot Nashon 5, begot Salmon 6, uh -huh. Salmon begot Boaz 7, Boaz begot Obed 8, Obed begot Jesse 9, Jesse begot David 10. Until the tenth generation. All these begotting were buying time. David was the man we were waiting for. For the seed now to begin to propagate as it was prophesied. Hallelujah. And I want to assure you, the devil has never won in any battle. He has never won. He may interrupt a few things. But at the end of the day, the agenda of God must come to pass. Because when you begin to read this one, there is a place where God confused the devil. Because Salmon married 
Rahab, the prostitute. So the devil knew, here God is not in a jail. I've messed up. What he did not know, Ruth again was not even an Israelite. So the devil was confused. But what he didn't know, God was still in the agenda. Because these ones, all of them, came from Judah. And he began to raise the picture of a Gentile church. That salvation will come to the Gentiles. So in the bloodline of Jesus, according to the flesh, he had Gentile blood. That's why salvation was not just for the Jews. It was for both the Jews and the... Because we have Rahab, a prostitute. Let me, let me even uh, encourage you. In the book of um, Hebrews 11, what they call the Hall of Fame, the name of Rahab appears there. The name of Mary is not there. The mother of Jesus is not there. Because, you know, when you read that story, when, when, when Joshua showed up, they said, go into the house of the prostitute and get me the woman. That is the scripture. What Joshua did, he never called for the prostitute. He said, in that house, there is a woman. I didn't come for the prostitute. I came for the woman who is housed in a prostitute house. It is a prophetic calling because in this house, there is a man that carries destiny. So he never entered to the limitation of the prostitute. That is who she was according to her trade. But according to prophecy, she was a woman meant to be in the lineage of Christ. So he said, go to the prostitute house, but don't bring the prostitute, bring the woman. May the woman in you begin to arise. Anything that became as a source of address, let it die. I want to assure you, when God looks at us, he does not look at us with our limitation. He sees us according to the destiny. He said, go to the house of Jesse. Anoint a man. The man came. And he was asked, is there no other man? He said, there is a boy. But in that boy, there was a man. In God, he never saw a boy. He saw a man. And the anointing that landed never landed on a boy. It landed on a man. Because the assignment was not for boys. It was for men. Goliath was a man of war from his youth. And David began his youth with killing a man that began to fight in his youth. May there be a shift in the spirit. May people begin to go beyond their limits. Let, let us understand the fact that there is a battle of the seed. On the other side of the cross, we overcame. We are victorious. We carry another DNA. I'm just laying this picture so that the church can understand the warfare has never ended, but on this other side we are fighting from a place of victory. Nothing shall bring the church down. Nothing shall bring the seed of God down. The devil has tried over history. He never succeeded. When Jesus said it is finished, he was announcing the war of the seed is over because he shall step upon the head of the serpent and on Calvary he did exactly that. The assignment of the church is to enforce the victory of Calvary. The assignment of the current seed is to enforce. That's why we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. We are not conquerors. We are more than conquerors. Jesus conquered so that we can become more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. That is why where he is we are. We are seated with him in heavenly places is far above principalities, powers, dominion, rulers, and names that can be mentioned under the heaven and even the earth and even anything that is under the earth. That is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not another assembly. We are a powerhouse, a redeemed seed. The Bible says uh, we are born of the incorruptible seed. We have another seed in us. The devil fought the other seed, but this one he cannot fight. The seed we are, it cannot be corrupted. It is an incorruptible seed. The Bible says, whatsoever is born of God has overcome the world. We are born of God. We are born of God. There is no battle for you. Only victory and overcoming in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let tell your neighbor, neighbor, the battle ended in Calvary and he lost it. 
and even in our time history will still be repeated he's still losing it hallelujah allow me to invite my family